Hello and welcome to our discussion of the right to privacy and the case called Griswold versus Connecticut. <clears throat> we need to uh, talk a bit about the concept of substantive due process as it relates to rights not specifically mentioned in the Constitution uh, and discuss a bit about uh, how uh, due process, th the concept of due process might help us to define those rights and give them some form and legitimacy and how uh, Supreme Court justices have interpreted uh, other parts of the Constitution to include a right to privacy. So let's get started. So uh, where do we find this right to privacy? Uh, s specifically, it is nowhere mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, but um, one might say that one has a right to privacy in their opinions and also a right to privacy in keeping their associations private. That's the whole point of the idea of uh, private association, union and combination. And so um, in the cases on, uh, on free speech rights of individuals brought before the House Un-American Activities Committee, uh, the court interpreted some of the speech rights of individuals as private. Um, the Third Amendment also suggests a right of privacy that exists in the home, a right to be free from uh, quartering soldiers uh, without consent. The Fourth Amendment also speaks to privacy in terms of search and seizure, that you have privacy in your person, in your house, your papers and effects, uh, and that privacy extends to unreasonable uh, freedom from, from unreasonable searches and seizures, and uh, also seizures that should have been preceded by a warrant but were not. The Fifth Amendment suggests a right of privacy in terms of your right to be informed of rights that you have before interacting with the state. For example, a right to remain silent. Um, also, the Ninth Amendment specifically says that uh, the list of rights in the Bill of Rights should not be construed to mean that there are no other ones. And uh, if we think back to an earlier section on due process, we know that the Supreme Court has, in fact, found rights not listed in the Constitution to be part of the meaning of due process in the 14th. Uh, Duncan versus Louisiana, a general right to trial. Um, also, uh, the Scottsboro Boys case uh, suggests a general right to an attorney uh, but not specifically the one mentioned in the Sixth Amendment, just a general right where due process requires it. Um, also, uh, the court has found the existence of other rights to be part of the meaning of due process in the 14th. And so one wonders a little bit about what, what um, purpose the Ninth Amendment serves if we can interpret the meaning of due process so broadly to include uh, other, other rights not not listed. Uh, and there it is, the 14th Amendment substantive due process guarantee, uh, the general guarantee of liberty, not simply a, a procedural form of due process, but a substantive one. So the members of the court have found a right to privacy in all of these different areas. And I think uh, those who have argued against a, a right to privacy, and early in my career I was one of those people, uh, th those people uh, tend to want their privacy when they want it uh, and then not to see it where it doesn't really concern them. Um, so my thoughts and ideas about privacy have changed significantly over the years and we'll, maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about where I think that right to privacy is found. So uh, here are some foundations. Uh, so in Lochner versus New York, the Supreme Court interprets a, uh, the right to contract to be part of the meaning of the word due process in the 14th Amendment. In other words, you have a substantive right to contract that exists as part of the meaning of due process and you don't have to point to any particular part of the Constitution to find it. Uh, uh, and, and this was a part of an era in which the Supreme Court was engaged in something called economic substantive due process jurisprudence. They were uh, finding a right to uh, 
a substantive right to due process and such things as uh, the right to con contract. And those things trumped other uh, powers of the state to maintain order. Um, in a dissent in a case called Olmstead versus United States, uh, the uh, 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 Brand uh, Justice Brandeis claimed that uh, uh, wiretapping was uh, was wrong, that it violated the privacy of individuals, um, uh, and uh, that that privacy had to be respected. In a case called Meyer versus Nebraska, the court was considering a ban on. Uh, uh, across the board ban on the teaching of the German language in Nebraska as part of the public school curriculum and in considering whether there was a uh, right to have your ed child educated in the German language to teach uh, the German language um, the court considered a lot of other things and it invoked a, as the, as the text says, it invoked a substantive due process approach to strike down the law that forbade schools to teach German uh, and other uh, foreign languages to children below the eighth grade. Here's what the court had to say about um, the, the liberty that was in, is invoked in the 14th Amendment uh, and how it protects more than simply a right to enter into a contract. Here's what it says. The right of the individual to engage in any of the common occupations of life, to acquire useful knowledge, to marry, to establish a home and bring up children, to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience, and generally to enjoy those privileges long recognized at common law as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. This is what due process in the 14th Amendment means. Now, let's uh, look at these a little bit. So, the court says in 1923 that due process involves the right to engage in any of the common occupations of life. Well, that seems to run contrary uh, to the court's decision in the slaughterhouse cases that due process did not mean uh, the right to uh, engage in an occupation without governmental interference. Uh, the right to acquire useful knowledge. The court said that education and other ways of, of acquiring knowledge are part of the meaning of due process. To worship God according to the dictates of conscience, well, we can point to something specifically in the Bill of Rights that, uh, uh, th that protects that. And generally to enjoy those privileges long recognized that common law is essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. Well, these are things that are not explicitly stated. So we see right off the bat that the Supreme Court is finding things as part of the meaning of due process in the 14th that aren't specifically mentioned in the text of the Constitution. In Mapp versus Ohio, a case we should have uh, read uh, earlier in the course, uh, the court invokes the exclusionary rule to say that when police violate your right to privacy, either in your person or, as in the case of Mapp, in her home, uh, that evidence illegally gathered may be excluded from trial for the purpose of gaining a conviction. Uh, and then that brings us to Griswold versus Connecticut. Now this case is very different from the others that we've looked at up until this point. Those cases involved economic rights and education uh, and, uh, and, and criminal rights. Griswold involves the right to uh, procreate. Uh, in particular, it involves a statute in Connecticut that made it illegal to distribute uh, condoms and other contraceptives to married couples. Estelle Griswold uh, calls up the police and says, please come down to the clinic I've established. I'm distributing contraceptives to married couples in violation of your law. So this is a test case really. She wanted to be uh, <clears throat> she wanted to be arrested so that uh, the Supreme Court could consider whether marital privacy and procreative privacy is part of the meaning of due process in the 14th. So the question is, does the due process clause of the 14th Amendment guarantee a right to privacy, privacy in marital relations? Supreme Court says yes, 7 to 2, and uh, Douglas writes the majority opinion 
but he doesn't take, and this is important, he does not take the substantive due process route. He says the law is invalid because the case concerns a relationship that lies within a zone of privacy that's created by a number of other fundamental constitutional guarantees, and he uses the word penumbra. Now he wants to stand the right to privacy on its own two feet, and he says that it can be extrapolated a, an actual right to privacy can be extrapolated from other rights that are mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, and uh, these rights have penumbras. Now penumbras, he says, are emanations. Uh, areas in which we're not certain whether a thing is, a, is part of one thing or part of the other. I'll give you an example. If you go out and look at the moon on a cloudy night, you cannot see a clear demarcation between where the moon starts and where the sky ends. There's this sort of hazy area around the moon that sort of blends into the sky behind it. And uh, that's called a penumbra. Justice Douglas says that the penumbra, ex uh, that, that the right of privacy exists in that sort of penumbra found in various rights in the Constitution. You should look closely at what he says those rights are. Other members of the court uh, dissent and they say, uh, for example, they say, well, this law is invalid, and we think it's a particularly silly law because, uh, but not because of a right to privacy, but because of substantive due process guarantee. Justice Harlan makes that argument. Justice Brennan signs on to his, uh, his dissent. Now, uh, after uh, Griswold, we get a number of cases, Katz versus United States, in which the Supreme Court says, that individuals have a right to privacy where they create it. So the right to privacy uh, attaches to the individual and not to the place. Uh, and the court says that using wiretaps on someone who's attempting to keep his conversation private, using wiretaps without a warrant, uh, is unconstitutional. In Stanley versus Georgia, the court admits to, identifies privacy in one's home, uh, that's the case related to uh, pornography, having pornography in the home. And uh, <clears throat> here, substantive due process was, was key uh, to making these decisions. And the court uses a uh, rational basis to make the decisions that, uh, that a right to privacy exists in the home uh, and in other areas of life. Now, the follow-up to... Um, uh, to Griswold was a case in which the Supreme Court said that a state does not have an interest in banning the distribution of condoms and other contraceptives to unmarried people. So the court extends the Griswold decision out from just married couples to all, also include unmarried couples because the court says the decision to bring a child into the world to procreate can be made outside of the decision to marry and that it is a deeply personal decision in which the state does not have a right uh, to meddle. So uh, that is our introduction to privacy and to Griswold versus Connecticut and we'll continue on uh, through this chapter.